Ladies and gentlemen, our special guest today on the Beginner's Mind series is a multiple award-winning executive coach, academic researcher, and leadership development professional who's been honored by the HRD World Congress and ACBSB Scientific Accreditation Body, Maria Presenton. She specializes in leadership and change management, two very important and pertinent subjects in the VUCA world that we live in today. She has successfully helped global organizations design and implement new cultures, integrate merger and acquisition efforts, and reduce attrition while increasing people's engagement. She holds a PhD in leadership and entrepreneurial innovation. So it's Dr. Maria Presenton, actually. And she also holds two master's degrees in strategic management and organizational research. She's a published author with a special interest in servant leadership, cultural dynamics, and social for-profit innovation impact. The topic of our discussion today will be servant leadership. Her book just came out in December 2021. The title is Key Factors and Use Cases of Servant Leadership Driving Organizational Performance. Currently, she's also the Principal and Chief Knowledge Officer at Leadership Scientific, which is a global consulting firm delivering executive education programs across the world. Before this, she has also held, held the position of Head of Learning and Development at the Ken Blanchard Companies in Asia. And she comes with a vast corporate experience, including roles at Siemens and other global major telecom prayers. She's also served as the Vice President of the International Coaching Federation in the Singapore chapter. And I happen to meet her back in Kuala Lumpur at a conference, I think about 10 years ago, an amazing individual, she brings a lot of warmth and charisma and impact in her presence. It's my pleasure to welcome today Dr. Maria Presenton. Hello, Simrajit. Hello, Maria. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. And um, I believe it was um, one rainy morning in Kuala Lumpur that we were co-speakers at the at the same conference and the subject of discussion I believe was leadership in fact on that day as well and I think I sat through your presentation you sat through mine I saw a lot of um, you know um, mutual interest there in, in terms of value addition to people at large and we had a um, an audience of about maybe 100 150 people and um, we've been in touch ever since and it's it's so nice to have this virtual chat today thank you so much for agreeing to do this Oh, it's my pleasure. It's so lovely to catch up with you. It's been such a long time, but I've been following you. I'm, I'm your fan. So oh, this conversation you. really brings me to, you know, a lot of joy. Well, thank you. Thank Likewise. you for inviting me. Likewise, I admire the consistency, the depth, and the impact of the work um, that you've been doing over the last decade. And uh, of special interest to me, and I'm sure of special interest to our audience today, is the term servant leadership. We might have heard about it from speakers and leadership gurus like Simon Sinek or John Maxwell or uh, Ken Blanchard for that matter. And I mean, w a lot of us are familiar with the term, plus, but please help us simplify it. What is servant leadership and how is it different from the traditional model? That's a really good question. And I get this question all the time. Uh, it's always mm -hmm. a pleasure to talk about servant leadership, not, not just because I research on it and I truly believe in it. I, I try to practice it mm -hmm. for several many years. For more than you know, 15 years, I've been in this subject. Mm -hmm. um, there are no consistent, agreed upon definitions on servant leadership. And uh, you know, researchers like myself and a, a lot of um, scientific, you know, uh, academic world, people that mm -hmm. are really focusing on server leadership, they, they come up with their own definition according to the topics that they go into right. while building the concept of server leadership in practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I can explore that a little bit more. But I'd, sure. I always like to go back to the original message from Robert Greenleaf, because server mm -hmm. leadership was this great idea that he came up with. Mm -hmm. And him not being a researcher, not being a, an academic, um, really just coming with you know like martin luther king one day he, mm -hmm. he comes up he comes up with the idea of i have a dream you know right. but he came up with wouldn't it be wonderful mm. if organizations people in organizations would um serve first 
before mm -hmm. they think about becoming a leader. Right. And so if you take that intention forward, what mm -hmm. this actually means is anybody can be a servant leader. Anybody could be caring mm -hmm. and contributing at the same time. Right. So the idea of a servant leader um, has got many characteristics, but the idea of the servant leader is, you know, every day when you're interacting with people, what's mm -hmm. your intention? Right. Are you intention to be their leaders? Mm -hmm. Or are you, is your intention to serve, to grow them and to increase their well-being? Right. And so you could actually just say that servant leadership, it's all a, it's motivated about serving others mm -hmm. and the outcome or measure that you need to be looking for is just two things. Mm -hmm. At the end of every interaction with you, mm -hmm. has this person grown, developed, mm -hmm. has this person, um, you know, increased in their well-being, in their right. self-worth? Because if these right. two things have happened, uh -huh. You've just practiced servant leadership, but you oh, could wow. do it in five minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually very action. simple to, to practice with yeah. the intention of, I think th that's something uh, very helpful, what you just mentioned, what you just outlined, is the fact that after spending some time with me and whatever I was formal or informal interaction with my, with my team member, has this person grown, has he or she benefited from the time spent together. So as opposed to the <laughs> traditional model of leadership that might run on caffeine, I'm assuming <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming this one uh, runs more on maybe deep breaths and sips of water and meditation. Yeah, well, yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a very um, appropriate question because in order to understand the practical utilization of the concept of server leadership because it's a philosophy uh -huh. um, it's a philosophy of life it's a philosophy of how you conduct yourself every day right and uh, and you know researchers like myself for the past 40 years we've come up with a bunch of behaviors that we could actually integrate them in in mm -hmm. practice in organizations because organizations really uh, have good intentions to to do better and, and right. to care for people. Um, and so we've got to put more structure around it, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So that being said, it starts with a mindset. It starts mm -hmm. with the philosophy of, you know, do, do I get up every day and mm -hmm. become a zombie and go to work and become a mm -hmm. zombie and just looking at KPIs? But how right. do I actually get those KPIs done through my mm -hmm. people? Right. Am I just you know, hammering on them and watching over their shoulders all the time? Or am I actually helping them to bring their creativity out, mm -hmm. serving them, developing them where they need help and where they don't need help to really back off a little bit and, sure. you know, be modest about things? Mm -hmm. um, you know, am I building trust mm -hmm. with them? Are they trusting me? Am I walking my values? Mm -hmm. walking and talking my values, finding that commonality with them. Mm -hmm. And also, to what extent am I aware that I'm actually just equal to them? Right. I could be their leader because mm -hmm. I've got a position power because I'm more senior because I'm older mm -hmm. sometimes. You know? mm -hmm. uh, but but I'm, I'm really just equal to them. And then, you know, one day I was talking to um, a colleague in the industry Mm -hmm. And I asked this colleague in the industry and I said, how, how would you see servant leadership, le leadership be implemented in your organization? Mm -hmm. And then he bravely said, leading without titles. Mm. That's brilliant. Right. It is. Of indeed. course you can have titles. You, know, you, you have titles so that the organizations are more efficient so that, you know, you kind of like narrow down your KPIs and, and you know, you, you, you divide between strategic and operational leadership. Uh -huh. uh, that being said, that intention of leading without titles is very helpful because you're it really is. helping each other to grow. Yeah, and you're not banking upon your positional power there. You, you have, exactly. uh, it is maybe expected from you or it's probably a strategic necessity that you've built trust, that you've made some deposits into the relationship bank accounts that you have with other people, that you've cared for them before you demand something from them. I mean, if I'm getting you correctly, the underlying premise here is if I look after my people, 
my people will help me look after what we're trying to do together. So it's like a joint venture. So, um, and what I meant earlier by, you know, the traditional mo leadership mo model being fueled by caffeine and servant leadership perhaps being fueled by water and meditation and deep breaths is, from what I understand, and help me clarify this please and correct me if I'm wrong, is that this will require way more patience than the traditional command and control, you know, I, I said so and you have to do this sort of, which is, it probably does not require a lot of patience. It's directive, uh, there are orders and you're supposed to follow them. And while, uh, you know, while these two models may coexist at times, you could be a directive leader yeah. as well as a servant leader. But I think when, when the whole question of making sure every interaction contributes in a positive way, it's also going to involve a lot of patience um, from the leader's perspective. What are your thoughts on that? And you're absolutely right. Servant leadership actually goes hand in hand with a lot of different leadership styles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's important for people to understand that uh, in certain occasions when it's necessary to have more instructions or what mm -hmm. you call the directive, more directive leadership style mm -hmm. in, in times of emergency, but I'm also assuming that in times of emergency is not every day, right? Mm. <laughs> so in times of emergency, because otherwise it, it becomes just a, a nerve wracking system, sure. right? And, and people are not growing. There's no innovation yeah. anymore. Yeah. Um, but the concept of servant leadership really enables a lot of creativity and innovation because you're really um, elevating mm -hmm. everybody else's potential to share and to be inclusive. Um, and it goes, you know, hand in hand with a lot of different leadership styles. It, it goes with, you know, situational leadership, which then you have the directive leadership style integrated as well as supportive leadership style. It goes right. with, you know, authentic leadership. It, it goes with a, a lot of these other leadership styles, empathic uh -huh. leadership. So you've got to be able to ascertain uh, the situation of. Uh, what is the leadership style that needs to be called in for right, on that right. particular time? Mm -hmm. but other things being equal on a daily basis, going to work, for example. So let, let's talk about you know the workplace, right? Yeah. That's um, true. If you're going to to work every day, every day, all things being equal, there is uh -huh. no such things as daily emergency. Then you mm. you really want to create an environment that is um, developing people. And, and that you're creating an environment where people are benefiting from each other's help towards growing each other, right? Mm -hmm. And so what, what's really important is for people to understand that you can't motivate others as mm -hmm. a leader because motivation is intrinsic. Mm -hmm. People have choices. Yeah. So you can't go over to somebody and say, I want you to do this, so I'm going to shake you. I'm going to pay you more money. They might mm -hmm. actually take it because they need it at that moment, but in the mm -hmm. long term, it won't last. they're not going to be loyal. They mm -hmm. don't want to follow you and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's really important is, is creating the environment that is motivating mm -hmm. for people to work in rather mm -hmm. than going and shake somebody. And, I, and love motivate somebody. I love that. I love that. I love that clear distinction that you made there. It's not about trying to motivate somebody to do something. It's about creating an environment that is motivating, that is stimulating, that is challenging enough so people want to come back in there and show up with their best selves, right? right. And, you, and you as a leader are facilitating the entire interaction there. Uh, you're making it happen. You, you are enabling. You, your role is that of an enabler. Um, and I, I like what you said in one of your videos, and I'd love to hear your thoughts a little bit more on that. Uh, in one of your presentations, um, I was just I just happened to tune into one of your webinars online. Power of followers, you mentioned, uh, and that followers are leaders. Now, th this is flipping the traditional model on its head, and it's it's a different perspective altogether. Followers are leaders. Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? And how can um, leaders process this and you know harness it to their advantage? This this new paradigm. Yeah. So um, again, I just wanted to clarify the word followers. It's actually a technical word uh, mm -hmm. in the research. Uh, so okay. it's a legitimate, legitimate word in research, right? So right, you've got right. leaders and you've got followers. Sure. And essentially the definition of followers in the research realm mm -hmm. is um, that, that somebody actually that takes direction from somebody else, from a leader. 
Mm -hmm. But today, in today's world, and you talked about VUCA just just now, and and yep. you know organizations, the teams are shrinking in size, mm -hmm. and you know the the different sectors and industries. There, are, some people will still have you know big numbers of, of team members, but then you've also got uh, different layers of escalation. Mm -hmm. But as teams are shrinking, and you know um, responsibilities are enlarging. Mm -hmm. And we are in a very knowledge-driven society. What actually happens is, for, exam for example, my, myself, mm -hmm. I, I run a company, but then I also am a professor at university. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also, I also belong to different types of associations and societies because I'm supporting them. Um, so uh, myself alone, I work in 11 teams. So what right. I'm trying to oh, say wow. here is, Mm. I'm sometimes in the same company learning from my team members, mm -hmm. although I could be the founder and the chief knowledge officer. Mm. If there's somebody else that has a better specialization that we need as a, in an organization, I'm going to go, I'm going to take off my title and I'm going to learn from them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm going to follow. Mm -hmm. I'm going to follow my team member because there's an expert in, mm. in a particular topic. Mm -hmm. But then in another situation, you know, I could be the president of a particular uh, um, association. And then afterwards, I'm really just, I'm, j I'm a team member as mm -hmm. part of a bigger uh, initiative. Sure. And I would contribute um, in a small task right. as part of a puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in a society t today, if you think about teams, we're in multiple teams between, on average, research tells mm. us between six to 11 teams at one go. Oh, wow. Mm. As we speak, I'm working in 11 teams. So mm. this is kind of like, you know, I don't even know where I find the time to do, to mm. do that. Mm. Yeah. And, and so what I'm trying to say is whether you're in the same organization or not, you're bound to, no matter how senior you are, how much experience you have, how, what, what your age is, you're bound to sometimes be part of a team member or mm -hmm. sometimes being a leader, but you're not always a leader. Sure. And so even if you're a leader, like you were saying before, you're, you're supposed to be facilitating rather mm -hmm. than command and controlling. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people are really bringing their expertise to the table. You've mm -hmm. got to be able to listen and really ascertain how to move forward with mm -hmm. all of that information. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about contribution. And so for, for people to contribute, we've got to be able to care and involve people. And if we didn't care, we can't involve them and they won't be able to contribute. Right. So server leadership is all about, if you want to summarize it in practical terms today in organization, mm -hmm. I see it into these two facets. You've got to care, okay. grow them, you know, feel that they, they are, you know, it's, it's beneficial to them. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a sense of well-being and then allow them to contribute and facilitate that contribution to be exposed um, so that they are um, sharing a sense of belonging in the team or whatever the team that they are uh, right. working with, but also a sense of uniqueness. So right. servant leadership actually contributes to inclusiveness, which is quite powerful. It is indeed. It is indeed by allowing people the space to bring their their best, their most powerful selves to work and to contribute in a meaningful, uh, meaningful way. I believe that's one of the core human psychological needs there. Uh, that's right. That's right. To, to be able to share the best of what I have in a meaningful way and in a way that it is appreciated and recognized by others. And yet all of this gets lost somewhere in the day to day firefighting that happens, you know, in most businesses where leaders are not paying attention to these subtle things. They're still stuck in a leadership model that is, belongs to the manufacturing age, you know, to the industrial revolution age, which was all about right. putting pieces together on an assembly line. And now the knowledge era, as you rightly said, demands a different paradigm. I'll just pause here and dwell on two things that you mentioned, which are very powerful. Uh, one, make every interaction count. And I think um, for, for leaders who've tuned into this conversation to learn today, uh, let that be your affirmation. Let that be your takeaway. I want you to type that in, in the comment section as your learning agenda number one. I'll make every interaction count in a positive way. Um, and that's leading with intention. I will make, I'll be mindful of every interaction. 
Um, if I just, I'm, if I'm just aware of the impact that I'm having on other people, am I demotivating them? Is my presence uh, confusing them? Am I giving conflicting instructions? Or am I adding in a meaningful way? So uh, make every interaction count. And in order for that to happen, uh, you need to be in peak shape as well, psychologically, emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, in order for you to be the sort of distributor of enthusiasm and patience and coaching and being the troubleshooter and problem solver for everybody, you gotta look after yourself as well. I, I feel, Maria, from my perspective, a lot of the times I see leaders who take themselves for granted. Mm. And what happens is there's only a certain limit to which you can you know, burden yourself with, with organizational responsibilities and sort of mental tasks and other things that demand and deplete your reservoir of patience and other things. And once you're running low, despite best intentions, you're not, you're not able to follow what you learned in that seminar or read in that book or heard in that podcast, for example. So it's important that you look after yourself as well to ensure that you're in that uh, right place. And the, and the second thing that you said later on about uh, the, a leader is not always a leader in all the settings. So I think it's very important to detach, learning to detach from your titles. We get obsessed, especially here uh, in some parts of uh, the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia also. I've seen that we place a huge premium on the title so much so that our sense of self-worth is now connected to my title and I'm going to be very sensitive about it and I'm, I'm so attached to it that I cannot look beyond it. I was reading about uh, the other day of the overview effect, Maria. The astronauts uh, experience when they go in space, many of them cry and they experience something that is called the overview effect. And the overview effect is this, that when they're out in space and they see the pale blue dot hanging in all this darkness and uncertainty around it, they suddenly have a, a deep sort of spiritual experience that humanity is, has been fighting itself and we've been killing each other for, for thousands of years for petty differences. And when they are able to look at things from the, at the big picture, they suddenly, oh, many of them have this deep spiritual insight which psychologists call the overview effect and I think leaders should also to be a good servant leader to detach from your title we also need to step outside the little boxes you know the the boxes of the organizational chart we need to step outside them take a look at the big picture and see what everybody's trying to do here together and let that be your source of contribution so I, I just wanted to just pause there and dwell on those two learning um, learnings that I had from what you said so far uh, now to simplify it for our audience uh, Maria could you for, for especially those in the leadership positions right now could, could you share you already mentioned some and I think this question might be repetitive uh, some core principles of servant leadership I think you already mentioned caring was number one uh, could you help us with the first three principles that our audience can apply in order to practice servant leadership yes so the first three principles and that's really based on my research in Asia on servant mm -hmm. leadership Mm -hmm. uh, so, so India is actually included in the mm -hmm. sample of our research. Okay. Um, so the, the principles, the, the principles uh, it, when it comes to the mindset of a servant leader, and then mm -hmm. there's, there are the competencies as well. The three principles of the mindset is that you've got to be humble. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Um, as a human being, and I'm not talking about being a leader, mm -hmm. a leader really inverted commas, because it's really what kind of a human human being you want to become right uh what is the best my best self that i can become that mm -hmm. i'm not yet today mm -hmm. and so can i be more humble mm -hmm. can i be more authentic mm -hmm. and um can i also make sure that um, i'm standing back and being mm -hmm. modest in mm -hmm. terms of my level of involvement mm -hmm. because uh, now I'm going to go into uh, the competencies, right? So if I'm mm -hmm. more humble, mm -hmm. I see you as my equal. Mm -hmm. Despite my title, mm -hmm. despite your title. So if I'm humble in my mindset, I see you as my equal, a competency. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if I see you as my equal, it is absolutely okay for me to ask you 
What's your speciality? What do you know that I don't know? Can you teach it to me? Can mm -hmm. I ask you for help? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a servant leader is exactly what you said when you summarized is a confident leader because I'm absolutely comfortable with my limitations mm -hmm. and my strengths. Mm -hmm. I know where I can add value at. I know where you could value at and I could ask for help. Right. My right. humbly, right? Humility. And, mm -hmm. and despite my title. So that's the first one, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the connection between uh, the intention of being humble Mm -hmm. and then translating into a competency because you practice it every day, right? It be sure. You become competent at it. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing is how, how can I become more authentic? Mm -hmm. Now, authentic is the direct translation into... It, it's not about saying what I want to say. No, it's mm -hmm. not that at all. It's, authentic is um, to what extent do I appreciate you mm -hmm. and... Um, giving you that acknowledgement that you are important. Mm. And so I know myself well, so it's very much connecting you to me, right? Because mm -hmm. it's an interaction. So as I know you, what are the values that I already resonate with you and therefore we can build trust, competency, mm -hmm. where we can both build trust with each other. Sure. So in order for me to become more and more authentic towards others, I'm mm -hmm. trying to find my values and live, you know, these are my core values. I walk with them. I live with them. I breathe them every day. Mm -hmm. And so I'm showing up quite authentically. Others can perceive me and they could resonate with my values, with their values. And so that mm -hmm. trust is built. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I get you. Yep. So it's building trustworthiness, but at the same time, trusting. So humility, um, authenticity, trust, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then and then you've got this. This is probably something that needs a little bit of practice. Right. Mm. Um, it's that mod modesty, which is the moderation. Mm. To what extent can you moderate mm -hmm. and, and see to, you know, that, that you're not getting too much involved or too little involved. Right. So that mingling between over supervision and under supervision and re, re and be there just enough mm -hmm. because you're making a difference in that person's life at that moment because they need you. Mm -hmm. And so here, it, we, technically, we call it the standing back intention, mm -hmm. which is very, very powerful because you stand back, you watch, you observe, you stand right. back. But then the competency is, I meet you where you are and I'll accept you. Mm -hmm. And we go from there. Is it more direction that I need to be giving you? Is it more support? Is it just for me to be quiet uh -huh. and watch you and to just back you up? But I'm there for you because right. I'm helping you grow. Which in turn build, uh, builds uh, psychological um, safety. You know, That's is, it. Uh, yeah. And uh, in That's that it. environment, people flourish. They, they are okay being vulnerable. They are okay talking about their things, areas where they need improvement. You, you sort right. of trigger um, a chain of events where people are now willing to be more authentic because you've just created an environment in which they are sure that whatever they reveal will not be used against them, right? So it's that trust that you're creating. I had a very important question coming to my mind, Maria, which is this. In most, um, I worked in the hospitality industry for eight years. Um, and you know how, how it works for the journal manager of a hotel. He or she also, they have their, the set of responsibilities that they're accountable for, revenue management, and so many other things that they are directly accountable for, in, in addition to leading a team of wearing anywhere between 200, 400, 500 people, different departments. Now, how does one balance, and what are your thoughts on this? How does one balance between operational responsibilities, making sure the ship is you know, running properly and everything is in order and the checklists are being followed and the standards are being maintained, and also practicing servant leadership and how, how do you balance one without compromising the other and while being mindful of the fact that there could be situations where operational urgencies supersede and everything else right I might have to just brush aside everything else and then really focus on the task at hand which is more operational in nature 
overlooking the human factor involved, overlooking the emotional intelligence involved. How does one balance between the two and what are your tips, especially for young leaders who might be finding themselves pulled into these two different directions? My management wants higher revenue and higher customer satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera. But I also feel the need to be there for my people. I also feel the need to mentor them and coach them. And I'm, I just don't have enough time or how do I juggle between these? What are your thoughts? That's a great question. And I get this so often. Um, mm -hmm. So I have a couple of thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. What I've, you know, working with so many teams across board industries and countries and organizations, um, what seems to be the common thread is if strategic leadership and organization and, and um, operational leadership, uh -huh. if they both are working with a common purpose, mm -hmm. then you've got something to gel in. Mm -hmm. As soon as you just work in a, oh, this is our industry, this is how we operate, and yep. uh, oh, customer is number one, and but then if customer is number one, how do you define the customer? Mm. So my question is always, are you talking about inter internal customers or external customers? Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about the, if, if you're absolutely obsessed about customer, because I usually ask my clients, mm -hmm. you know, what are you obsessed about? And they're right. like, customer is number one, customer is number one. And I'm like, when was the last time you senior leadership, and I'm dealing with a lot of C-level executives, right? Mm -hmm. When was the last time you've met a paying customer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're like, that's mm. not our job. I'm like, is right. it not? Right. That's interesting, mm -hmm. right? So they don't define customers um, in such a way that it's everybody, all stakeholders, right? Uh -huh. um, and so it's, it's really important for us to really have that definition of a customer, right? Mm. So there's the paid customer and there's also the internal customers, which is our people. Mm -hmm. So if you're an organization that doesn't really care about your internal customers first, then what business are you in? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're not taking care of your people, what actually happens is, you know, the, the next time I get more pay, I'm just going to move on. Mm -hmm. True. So, so loyalty doesn't come because you pay carrot and sticks. Loyalty mm -hmm. comes because you're creating an environment or a culture. People like to call mm -hmm. it culture. They right. create an environment that is really optimal for people to work in. Mm -hmm. You've got leaders that ask, um, what can I do for you so that you can succeed? Mm -hmm. Those are servant leaders just because mm -hmm. they ask a different question instead of saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm here to catch you. You've just made a mistake. Make sure you don't do this again. So mm -hmm. do you think you're going to be more motivated working with this kind of a leader or, or somebody that passes by and, and says, mm -hmm. Maria, how was your day today? Mm. So, okay, I hear your challenges. What, what should I do to help you? Mm -hmm. Can you give me an idea? So, so this is the type of leader that would be listening to me. Mm -hmm. A leader mm -hmm. that wants to learn from my direct interactions with the customers that he or she no longer has. Right. So what I'm trying to say here is in the daily operations and the strategic leadership, it's it's not difficult to implement servant leadership when you have conversations with people that are directly related to the paying customers and internal customers. Mm -hmm. And that those conversations and challenges get seeds through as required and important information to the top, to the strategic leadership so that they can mm -hmm. do something about it. Mm -hmm. and, and so operating servant leadership or implementing servant leadership in organization it's a daily routine mm -hmm. where information is coming from the markets, from the clients, from mm -hmm. the internal people to the senior leadership. And then the senior leadership needs to be able to get that feedback and to learn from that information and allow a certain amount of empowerment of decision making with the people that are more direct, directly related to the customers. Because if that's not allowed and everything is really centralized in the top that's not going to work right um so what, I, what i've seen this done really successfully is when you you, you know the, the the chinese symbol of yin and yang mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of like that right yeah, the yin yeah. and yang mm -hmm. so sometimes the strategic leadership has to make some decisions 
but on the information from the bottom from the market because they're mm -hmm. closest to the customers and sometimes they need to suggest decisions mm -hmm. bottom up to the right. senior leadership because the senior leadership has a different role mm -hmm. right and so every year on year when they come up with targets of course you know they, they have to have you know feasibility studies and, and look at, at uh, you know how the previous years were done and look at the pipeline and all sorts of things but those conversations with different stakeholders that need to get a lot lot closer Indeed. because otherwise it's not going to work out top Indeed. down is not going to work anymore. Mm, and and um, I hope more leaders have this realization sooner uh, than later that it, the top down sort of uh, you know it's been decided and now you figure out a way to do it um, is probably not the best way taking strategic initiatives forward. I love what you said about from that customer service perspective. You solved my problem. You solved that question. You answered it very well when you, uh, you know, in terms of you, you solved that issue right there in the first uh, sentence when you said, who are your customers? If you're obsessed, what are you obsessed about? And if the answer is customer service, then define your customers. Is it only the people who are walking into your premises and paying money? Or it's also the people who are serving the people who are walking in? And some That's of the leading right. hospitality companies in the world have figured this, this out correctly, and I hope they practice what they preach, which is, I mean, the Ritz-Carlton has this credo, for example, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. So it, it's, it's about the, the an environment which treats you at par with those visiting your properties. Marriott Hotels also has something similar. They talk about if we look after, I think it was Bill Marriott who said this, if we look after the people who look after our customers, and then customer service, great customer service will automatically, should automatically happen. Happy people create happy customers, right? But you cannot, you cannot overlook the happy people part. It's not just a fancy, beautiful five, seven star building that's gonna bring a smile on people's faces. Anybody can duplicate that, right? But what cannot be duplicated is a great culture of caring, not just for people who walk into that building to spend money, but also the people who dress up to show up every day to look after the people who come into that. And once there is more, yeah, sorry, you were gonna say something, please. Yes, and, and um, um, I wanted to also add that if you interview as a, you know, if you disguise, if you're a CEO and you disguise yourself mm. as, you know, one of the colleagues in the mm -hmm. organization and you interview mm -hmm. um, the people that are directly facing the customers, the bartenders, uh, the restaurant, you know, waiters and waitresses, yeah. um, you know, the, the, uh, the people that make up the room, housekeeping and stuff, mm -hmm. stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you just spend a little bit of time before you go to the paying customer and, and meet with B2B customers, B2C customers, mm -hmm. you know, spend time with your internal people that are serving directly operationally to the customers, the paying customers, mm -hmm. and ask them, what makes you stay? Mm, that's a great question. Remember the, 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 remember the measures of servant leadership. Mm. Are you growing? Mm -hmm. Are you benefiting? Mm. Are you growing? Is your well-being increasing? Mm -hmm. This basically tells us, is our environment optimal for you to work inside? Right. Right. So, so I would just, if I was a CEO or a C-level executive, vice president, what have you, it doesn't matter. I'll just mm -hmm. go and, you know, record all my interviews, you know, take a, take a sample of a hundred people, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. what's your intention? Do you intend mm -hmm. to stay? Mm -hmm. Do you intend to help others, help each other when mm -hmm. there are difficulties, when you see mm -hmm. somebody in need? Mm -hmm. So. Do you, do you intend um, to work extra hours when it's needed? Right. Or do you rather just go home and even if you're just, you know, you're, you don't have any, anything important to take care of, you just want to go home. Uh, you can't spend a minute here, you know? <laughs> so, so what are your key intentions mm -hmm. at the end of the day? Would you stay if mm -hmm. there's no additional pay? Do you intend mm -hmm. to perform? Do you intend to be productive? Mm -hmm. And so forth, right? So what we actually see is there's a huge difference between mm -hmm. people that apply servant leadership or um, just very autocratic leadership. Mm -hmm. And we see that, and this is specific, specifically uh, about Asia, the, the mm -hmm. research that I did. Mm -hmm. um, when you apply behaviors and intentions of servant leadership, 
what happens is the person that receives those intentions and behaviors from the leader, they would do everything to follow that leader. They mm-hmm. would be loyal to the leader. They would uh, do everything for the organization because the leader is representing the organization. So there's a mm-hmm. direct link between the how the person leads to what he or she represents as the image of the organization. Sure. Because each single leader, no matter whether it's a small division leader, huge department leader, Mm -hmm. uh, a group leader, you create a mini culture in your team. Mm -hmm. And so that particular way of working with each other is your mini culture. Mm. And so they, if the leader, that's when the, when the leader leaves and goes to another company, they tend to follow that leader. Mm-hmm. So those yep. intentions are the strongest measure of the uh-huh. outcome of success of a particular leadership style. And I think there'll be a wealth of information if top level executives are willing to have these conversations, you know, whether disguised right. or, or, or otherwise, uh, you know, if, if, if it helps, if people open up, you will listen to some very valuable inputs and it's important that you take action on them, right? It's important that you record them somewhere. It's important because sometimes some things will come to your notice, which will not probably be captured in surveys or suggestion boxes or things like that. Um, and, uh, Maria, my my next question, and this is a great topic that we're exploring. My next question was going to be, a a thought just crossed my mind. Could there be a situation where we can say, this is servant leadership gone too far? This is uh, the pitfalls of what a leader should be aware of, you know? Uh, Whether it's the leader is experiencing burnout herself, or she's uh, in the desire to be a servant leader, taking too much responsibility on her, or creating... um, maybe an expectation of dependency that, you know, um, rather than a, being a coach is like, oh, I'm, I'll be there to solve problems for you. Uh, and then, so talk to us and in your consulting practice, in your coaching practice, you must have come across some instances like that. What are the pitfalls that, um, especially young leaders who get really gung-ho about, oh, I learned this concept and I'm going to practice it. And then they realize they probably took it too far and um, and now they're experiencing the outcomes which they cannot undo in many situations. What would your thoughts and s- tips be on that subject? It's very appropriate question. I, I want to mm. clarify to everybody: servant leadership is not a slavery leadership. <laughs> so you're not, you don't become somebody's slave. Yeah, right. mm. <laughs> that, that's that's not well. That's well, wrong. So, some leaders find, <laughs> they they complain when I speak. They complain uh, to me in circumstances <laughs> like that. Oh my God! He said by by oh, by keeping the open door policy, I get zero time to focus on what I need to do. I get well, zero time to do the envisioning or the strategic things. So yeah, right. But thanks for clarifying that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's it's no. Th- thank you for that question. It's uh, it's mm. not it's not slavery. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and servant leadership is not doing things for others. Mm. Servant leadership is not being overly kind. People mm. have KPIs, they have to do their own KPI. Mm-hmm. But a servant leader that helps others in terms of succeeding in their KPIs, mm. listen, to my, listen to my words, right? I'm helping mm. you succeed in your KPIs, but the KPIs are yours, mm-hmm. so please mm-hmm. own them. Right, right. So I'm not taking okay. the ownership. I'm assisting. No. I'm, I'm, right. I'm assisting. I might right. be there in the backdrop, but the ownership is yours. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that goes together with um, the three, um, you know, the, the, the three intentions that I just talked about, right? Be modest. Mm-hmm. It's your mm-hmm. KPI. If you've got any challenges, I'll meet you where you are. And if there's a, a particular training that you need to sit in, right. uh, you need to be coached or uh-huh. even not coaching. You need actually straight on just mentoring because I have a similar right. experience. So let me just teach you how to get there. Talk to uh-huh. me, tell me what you need and I'll get you there, right? Or I'll find somebody to get you there. Mm-hmm. So it's about developing others to succeed. Mm. Right? It's mm-hmm. always, I'm always talking about the same thing is developing others to succeed, but you take ownership, please, on your KPIs, on your mm-hmm. goals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, because if I'm your leader, I, I have my own goals and they don't belong to you either. They're right. mine. Mm-hmm. So yeah, let's let's be really clear about the roles. Mm-hmm. Right, or so policy? It's very convoluted. I don't even know what that means. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you've got to define what open policy means, or just change the sentence. Mm-hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. So the servant leadership needs to have structure. Indeed. Right? If you're giving Indeed. time away to develop others and to increase in their well-being, you've got to set up a system to do that. Indeed. You've Indeed. got to have a structure that works, right? right. And, right. you know, you, you set up a structure with the team, uh, if you've got team members, and ask them, would that work? Uh, so, but you've got to also set boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked about earlier today that servant leadership is a strong, has a strong sense of who they are. Mm -hmm. Servant leaders are, have a strong sense of who they are, mm -hmm. what they've achieved, what their limitations are uh, to proceed. Mm -hmm. So they're very confident people. Right. They live by their values. Uh -huh. Right. So uh -huh. if you know the, the other type of uh, people that you just talked about, you know, I'm just giving myself away. Mm. Those are not necessarily servant leaders. They're they're really just people that give themselves away, and I don't mm -hmm. have a word for it. Mm. Um, so you've got to you've got to yeah. Really you guys, have so if if you can identify with those descriptions, you know who you are, guys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've got to set set a structure and a system to actually implement it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're not a very structured person, no problem. Then partner with people that can support you mm. on that. You don't have to do everything alone. That's why server leadership works because I know my limitations. I need to set the structure. I'm not a very structured person. Who is in my team member members who can help me do that? Could support me, right. right? So that's why you you meet together. You come up with ideas together. Do we all uh -huh. buy into the same purpose? Yeah. And therefore, who could take what role to set this up? Right? Mm. You can't, you don't have to do everything alone. You need to be quite aware, however, who you are, what mm -hmm. you can and cannot do and ask for help. It doesn't matter your title. That's great. That's, <laughs> that's great clarity there because um, I think um, some people feel that there is some sort of glory out there for being, you know, for sacrificing everything, your time, energy, your personal life, pursuits outside of work to say, hey, you know, I'm the best servant leader that possibly could ever exist on this planet. And I think uh, my takeaway personally from what you just said, Maria, is for leaders and people in positions of power and influence and authority to get over the superhero myth, you know, and stop trying to be that superhero. Right. It's been fed to us by movies, you know, it's been fed to us as young kids, yeah. uh, you know, oh, this one person walks in and he or she can just change. It's she recently, it used to be the he before, uh, by and large, only we had one or two uh, female superheroes coming in. But then we've been fed on this thing that this one person can just magically make all the problems vanish. And there are people trying to live up to that expectation. And I say to you, that's a trap. It's a trap. There is no glory in burnout. There is no glory on having zero personal life. There is no glory in broken relationships and divorces and bankruptcies and bad health and cardiovascular problems uh, just because you, you, you've just given yourself away too much. And as Maria rightly said, you have not set and communicated healthy boundaries of what you can and cannot do. Servant leadership, as I interpret from what you just said, is not about creating a dependency on you, is about being an enabler that I'm there to back you up, but the ownership is yours at the end. What a fantastic conversation here today. I have a lot more clarity from what was just an academic term to me before, Maria, and I really thank you for that. Before we let you go, any parting words of inspiration for, especially for our young viewers and listeners across the world who might be just stepping into their first role into what is now a very uncertain, dynamically changing digital VUCA world. And there's, there's a lot of uh, anxiety around so many issues. What would you, and, and, and one more thing, it, it, on, in, in the, the world that they're stepping in, we've glorified narcissist leaders, you know, people obsessed with their own self-image. You know, somehow in the, in the recent past, we've seen a huge growth in uh, the sort of um, uh, followership these leaders have had in different parts of the world, whether it's in social, political, or sports, or business world. What would you like to say to our young viewers from your vast experience, Maria? Yes, and you know, many, 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 many years ago, I was also that age once, right? 20 something <laughs> years old. Or yeah, even me younger. too. With the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> but you're still looking good. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. With all a lot more gray hair now. Yeah. <laughs> so, what I'm really passionate about um, with the younger generation is mm -hmm. that they really want to make a difference today. Uh huh. 
And I would encourage everybody to say, you know what? Stay on that track. Mm. Find out what is your contribution. And you might not find out until probably 10, 20 years later. It doesn't matter. Build right. yourself up. Learn. Learn from everybody that you can. Mm. Um, and and, and re be humble. Be authentic. Find out your core values. And some of your core values might not be your parents' values if you grew mm. up with parents or caretakers. Mm -hmm. uh, but find your own values because you're becoming young adults, right? Mm -hmm. um, be authentic with those values, live those values every day. Right. Um, and then, you know, it, it's okay to be gung-ho, but really mm -hmm. set boundaries and stand back a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Really the three core principles of the mindset of a, a servant leader, you, you can serve. And if you, no matter whether you're opening a business, becoming an entrepreneur, or you're working mm -hmm. for a larger organization, make sure that your contribution is to um, serve somebody. So mm -hmm. as long as you're serving somebody, mm -hmm. your life, your, your career is going to grow mm -hmm. because that mindset of contributing to somebody's well-being, contributing to somebody's development, they're sure. feeling good about themselves. You're, you're creating self-worth. Mm -hmm. For yourself and others, because when you're when you're healing others, when you are contributing to others, mm -hmm. you you evolve, you become Indeed. better. Indeed. So no matter what kind of a business, you can always do good. That being said, be quite clear about what we just said. Right. So set your boundaries. Mm -hmm. You know, be quite clear about what you can accept and what you can't accept, mm -hmm. and uh, politely say no. Yeah. But you've got to be able to set your boundaries and, and know you, who you are. That's mm. for the young people. May I also give a, a message to the Gen Xers sure. and the older millennials? Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah. yeah. So, so for more senior leaders in organizations or entrepreneurs um, that you know, they're hiring and stuff, have a really good onboarding system. Have mm. a really good onboarding system and if possible, Support the young to generate new new ideas. Listen to them. Have forums where you senior leaders are actually sitting with them and mm -hmm. asking them, "How should I run my business today?" Mm. Indeed, that's 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 great. So they feel <laughs> they feel that their opinion is valued. Those are wonderful thoughts there for cutting across. You know, whether it's. Uh, the age segments or uh, you know whatever title we go by a um, couple of very important takeaways be authentic uh, be humble clarify your values be open to learning and don't fall um, prey to the superhero myth and again um, know your boundaries learn to say no that was a very important one and i think the ability that's a superpower that's a superpower and it's not just learning to say no to other people it's also about learning to say no to certain addictions that we might develop at times. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's posting on social media or responding or taking everything on social media too seriously. It's about what do I need to stop that is hindering my progress? I already have within me the ability to do what I want to do, but there are certain things I need to stop. To learning, developing that muscle to say no to those things, I think that will really uh, push you forward in your career. That, that's a great piece of uh, advice there. Uh, let me also remind uh, our viewers that Maria's book, Key Factors and Use Cases of Servant Leadership Driving Organizational Performance, which released in December 2021, is available for purchase. We will share the link in the description, as well as I highly encourage you to connect with her on LinkedIn and all other social media platforms to gain for her immense wisdom. She's a leading authority on the subject of servant leadership. Uh, and so please feel free to connect with her on these social media platforms as well. And if you might have any questions, uh, follow up questions based on the conversation we had today, <coughs> leave those questions or comments for us in the comment section and we will try and get back to you. Once again, Dr. Maria, it's been an immense pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. Thank you, Tim Rajiv, and thank you all. Thank you. Pleasure having you.